Can we just rise to our feet? Let's take a Bible reading. The book of Isaiah chapter 30. Now we got already last time, I may jump a few verses here and there so as to save time. From verse 1, again I'll read from the Living Living Translation. It says, Woe, what sorrow awaits my rebellious children, says the Lord. You make plans that are contrary to mine. You make alliances not directed by my spirit. Thus piling up your sins, he said, For without consulting me, you have gone down to Egypt for help. You have put your trust in Pharaoh's protection. You have tried to hide in his shade. He said, by trusting Pharaoh, you will be humiliated. And by depending on him, you will be disgraced. For though his power extends to Zon, and his officials have arrived in Hanes, that is, they've extended their borders, all who trust in him will be ashamed. He will not be able to help you. Instead, he will disgrace you. This message came to me concerning the animals in the Negev. Now, I was talking about transportation. The caravan moved slowly across the desert, the terrible desert to Egypt. Donkeys weighed down with riches and camels loaded with treasure, all to pay for Egypt's protection. They traveled through the wilderness. They traveled through the Mediterranean Sea, a place of lionesses and lions, a place of bad boats, a place of bad transportation, bad ships, a place where vipers and poisonous snakes live. A place where people drown. Oftentimes you read about it in the news. All this and Egypt will give you nothing in return. You know what they call stowaways? People crawl into the, the carriage, you know, space for the, you know, where the aircraft keep their tires. And then so they will fall from the sky over Europe and land on the ground. That's what he's referring to. Just because they want Egypt's protection. They travel through the wilderness. All this and Egypt will give you nothing in return. Egypt's promises are worthless. Therefore, I call her Rahab, the harmless dragon. He said, now go and write down these words. Write them in a book. They will stand until the end of the time as a witness that these people are stubborn rebels who refuse to pay attention to the Lord's instructions. They tell the seers, stop seeing visions. They tell the prophets, don't tell us what is right. Tell us nice things. Tell us lies. Forget all this gloom. Get off your narrow path. Stop telling us about the Holy One of Israel. Now the Holy One of Israel replies, because you have, because you despise what I tell you and trust instead in oppression and lies, calamity will come upon you suddenly like a bulging wall that bursts and falls. In an instant, it will collapse and come crashing down. Verse 15. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength. But you will not, he said, you will have none of it. You said, now, no, we will get our help from Egypt. They will give us swift horses for riding into battle. I always like to read this portion of New Living and New American Standard. It's very beautiful there. Verse 16. But from 15. For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you were not willing. Instead, what did you say? Verse 16. No, we will flee on horses. Therefore, you shall flee. And we flee on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. He said, 1,000 will flee at the threat of one man. You will flee at the threat of five until you are left as a flag on a mountain top and as a signal on a hill. What does God really want? Verse 18. He said, so the Lord must wait for you to come to him. I'm back to New Living Translation. So he can show you his love and compassion. For the Lord is a faithful God. Blessed are those who wait for him. Now, I'll stop reading that there. Quickly, Jeremiah chapter, Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. We'll come back to Isaiah in a moment, but since we're already going to Lamentations, let's get there. 
He said, remember my affliction, verse 29, verse 19, sorry. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. These I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. What do I recall? The Lord's loving kindness indeed is loving kindnesses never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah said, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, we have hope in him. And we have expectation in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the person who seeks him. He said, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he should bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit, sit alone and be silent, since he has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. Perhaps there is hope. Let him give his cheek to the smiter. Let him be filled with reproach, for the Lord will not reject forever. For if he causes grief, then he will have compassion, according to his abundant loving kindness. For he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the land, to deprive a man of justice in the presence of the Most High, to defraud a man in his lawsuit. Of these things, the Lord does not approve. Now let me just stop reading this one here. Now let's now go back to the book of Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. After that, you can take your seat. Let's just quickly finish with that then. I will start talking, 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 and do plenty of it, and then we'll go home. The Lord is good. Now, for time's sake, I'll just shorten what I want to read to a few verses. Uh, I'm going to the end of it. Let's just read the last two verses. Verse 10. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves in firebrands, walk in the light of your fire, and among the brands you have set ablaze. This you will have from my hand, you will lie down in torment. Now I declare that the Lord has given me this spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And I'm being filled with the knowledge of his will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. As a result of this, I'm walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. I am pleasing him in all respects. I'm bearing fruit in every good work, and I'm increasing in the knowledge of God. Now again, I incline my ears to his word. The word is entering my heart. It's giving me light and direction. It is healing me in every area. And it's making me more and more like the Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, let's take our seats. The Lord is good. Now, I'm just going to review briefly what I began to say last time. And hopefully, I'll finish everything today. Like I said, it's not supposed to be a long series of teachings. I just want to share something with us briefly on how God um, solves our problems and how our lives should be as uh, children of God. Let me just remind us of uh, one important point. We are not average people, and that is not psyching ourselves. That's not just trying to feel good. That is a matter of fact. That is a matter of fact. That is a matter of fact. There's a definition I heard long ago for the word prophet. No one would hear the word prophet. We often look at it to mean that somebody who sees into the future, somebody who um, you know, can tell you what's happening in your life or some, something like that, but once I heard a preacher say something, that the Bible says that it, says, it suffered no man to do them wrong, no, saying, touch not my anointed, and do, don't do my prophets any harm. You know, and when he said that, he, said, he explained something which I've never, I never heard until that point, that the word prophet in that circumstance was not referring to people who declare things. And you will find out that Abraham was not really, go and check it, I don't know if you can tell me one, I can't remember any, or pro, Abraham was not prophesying about the future. And that particular context of the scriptures, that's uh, Psalm 105, all right? He said, he said, he, let me just read that. He said from verse 8, he has remembered his covenant forever. 
the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac, all right? Then he confirmed to Jacob. So it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for a statute, you no? Know, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. He said this when there were only a few men in number, very few and strangers in it. And they wandered, now listen to this, from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another kingdom. He permitted no man to oppress them, and he reproved kings for their sakes. What was he saying? Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. And when Abimelech took Abraham's wife, you know what he said to Abimelech? He said, the man, the man you took, he returned his wife, then let him pray for you. He said, for he is what? A prophet. He was talking about Abraham. All right, so a prophet in the, in the context of the Bible is not just somebody who goes around prophesying. Abraham was called a prophet. You can see the Jacob here was called a prophet. And the Isaac, most certainly, was called a prophet. And the Bible says that he's, God gave a word concerning them. Do, don't do my prophet any, no, um, touch not my prophet, touch not my anointed ones, and do my prophet no harm. So the pastor said that time that what's a prophet is a person that God shapes the events of this life around. Who is his anointed one? The person for whose sake he shapes the events of this life. For example, the main reason why there was famine in Egypt was so as to, on the land at that time, was to move Israel into Egypt for preservation. And what God was doing was preserving Israel. That what God was doing was taking them out of the way, like he said, until the iniquity of the Amorites to be full. And when he was talking about Amorites, we're not just talking about the Amorites you know, nation alone, but all the nations around them who he had to, sorry to say it like this, who he had to wipe out, who he had to prevent them from contaminating the seed that was going to come, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus had to be born of a pure lineage. And that lineage must not have, must not be contaminated by the iniquities and the genes, can I use that expression, of those people. So he had to keep them. So he took them away for safekeeping into Egypt. And at the right time, he brought them back. So why was there famine? It was so that they could move. I hope you're getting my point here. That's what happened. So you find certain people, God dictates or causes things around to happen because of them. I give the example all the time, and that's why then I prayed, and that's why I wrote the tract that we all equal before God. Job, they wanted to tempt Job, and look at the people that died, and they said it's temptation for Job. I said, are those people not human beings? You want to tempt Job? He, he, no, he, 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 um, his servants all died. They were, because they were working for the man, they died. And they didn't say they were being tempted. Their wives were not being tempted. Their children were not being tempt- tempted. It was Job that was being tempted. No, think about it. David sinned. 70,000 people died. I'm not aware of anybody in his household because we were just about to enter Jerusalem. And who sinned? David. Even his men protested what was going to happen. He said, sir, you can't do this. Even Joab warned him. He said, sir, no, we can't do this. Jake and David insisted, yet he was not punished <laughs> personally. I hope you're getting my point here. That is the way life is so. Please, if you haven't, go and read that my tract again. I will only call before God. Some people are more, more important than other people. Whether you like it or not, that's just the way life is. A lot of us Christians don't understand it. We need to get up, you understand, and claim our position in God. Not just by saying that I'm important, I'm important. You have to make choices that show that you're important. You cannot be behaving like the tail and say you are the head. You don't need to know which one is the tail of the dog. Sorry, you don't need to be told. Just look at the dog. This is the head. This is the tail. The, the head does not come and say, I am the head of the dog. I am the head. No. All you need to do is watch it. Which one does the dog wag is the tail. That, that's the way it works. And the head and not the tail. It's not just a declaration. It's how you behave. If every change in weather, you move up and down, you are the tail and not the head. If every change in the economy, you have gone, you have been tossed to and fro by environmental circumstances, you don't have a staying power, you are the tail and not the head. I hope you're getting my point here. All right? So, as believers, what God made us is that, listen, we are not common people, we are unique people. And please claim it and behave like that. Claim it and behave like that. Claim it. Behave like it. So things may happen around. It is not for the common reason. 
I was saying something last time, I didn't finish explaining it. That I look, and as far as I'm concerned, listen, this is Nigeria. Let me speak like a prophet into the nation. I am convinced, I don't have any doubt. The problems in Nigeria are caused by the church. I am convinced, I don't have any doubt. The church, now we need apostles who will speak to preachers, who will speak to the leaders of the church and call them to order. And let me say it again. God is patient, he's long-suffering, but he's not ever suffering. He's not ever suffering. If he calls the church leaders to order and they don't come into order, he will remove them. I hope you're getting my point. It is the will of God to scatter denominations. It doesn't, be, it doesn't, it doesn't, I, I don't feel bad if the church, church splits. It should, it should split. It has to split. It's in the Bible like that. Paul said something like, something like this. That there has to be division amongst you when some people are doing right and some people are doing wrong. So the church splits. I just want to know what split the church. Because once some people are doing right, some people are doing wrong, the church will split. Jesus is not split. It's a denomination that split. I hope you're getting my point. Is it, it's going to happen. I keep on saying it. Watch out. God will scatter some of the things we have built. He will destroy them. He will move them up and down. He will shake them. Do you know why? Because we are the... You know, you know what he said? If the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? That is Nigeria as a nation. Any nation, especially on this continent, has no hope. Everywhere, not only on this continent, America, the same thing. They have no hope. They have no hope if the church starts misbehaving. No matter how crazy the world is, if the church does not join them, there's, 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 there's hope. You talk about corruption, if you're limited to APC and PDP, there's no trouble. But when, when CAN joins, PFN joins, then there is trouble. He said, if the light that is in you is now darkness. He said, how great is your darkness? The church is not allowed to shift goalposts. You don't shift your standards. The world says that homosexuality is normal. The church now starts debating, not in Nigeria. No, we don't. There are certain debates we don't have. And that's a sign there is hope. The, so, the church now starts this, no, debating in some countries um, whether it is right to ordain homosexuals or not, whether the church can join. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> you know, I'm just thinking, these two men come and meet that they want to marry. <laughs> I, I, you know, we're not having the debate. Now, whether you wed them or not, it's not the same now. That you had that debate is a problem. There are debates that you should not have had. The world can go crazy. I just remember something one brother sent to me now. Let me show you how crazy the world can be. How many people have heard of LGBT? You know what it means? Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. All right. You think that's a problem? Somebody sent me an, ad, uh, an advert. Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, that's Canada. They, have an inclus- they had an inclusiveness training, They're advertising it. Somebody took a picture of the advert and sent it to me. And you know what they had? LGBTTTIQQAAPP training. <laughs> you know LGBT. This is L G G B D T T T I Q Q A A P P training. Let me know, boy. Each one, and then I gave the full meaning below: lesbian, gay, gender queer, bisexual, demisexual, transgender, transsexual, two spirit, intersex, queer, questioning, asexual, allies, pansexual, polyamorous. And there's a training for elementary school teachers on inclusiveness. And you will get up, tell me you want to carry your children where it is safe, where they can be. (laughs) Let me not say more than that. Let me not say more than that. I don't want to say more than that. You know, it gets me angry. Let me just say the truth. You don't believe in God. Let's stop telling ourselves lies. Spiritual things don't matter to you. There's no way to say you're a true believer. And spiritual things would not matter to you. It is not possible for you to get up in the morning. I mean, if the condition of roads, if the condition of electricity, if educational system can matter to you, and if you say you believe in God, why don't you even ask yourself, where is God's place in all of these things? After all, this one I just told you, they are training the people, this education system that you are running for, this is what is being taught to the teachers. And you get up in the morning and you say that that's good education. If you were God, how would you treat you? 
Will you answer you if you are praying? I'm about to, you now start saying funny things. And I, I, I will train my children in the house. You see, please, you must understand what I say. We are talking about your system of valuation of things. We're talking about how you value. That's what we are talking about. That you value a person who is stand. That a, somebody will be inspiring your children on a daily basis. Having decided that I'm not satisfied with the, you know, the gender of my birth. I was born a man. But I am a woman. And then it starts, sits in front of your child every day. I don't know the battle you want to fight against that spirit. Especially when it was a choice you made. Especially when it was a choice you made. You know, I don't get it. I don't get it. When people say they are Christians and they believe in a particular way. Let me t- give it to you straight. If your wife is pregnant, don't look for money to go and deliver abroad. Go to one hospital around. Pray. Get a good obstetrician. Get a good hospital for her to deliver. That child will still become where it's supposed to be. That money of traveling abroad is a waste. He said, those that sow to the spirit, from the spirit they will reap life. Those that sow the flesh, what will happen? From the spirit, they will, from, the, from the flesh they will reap corruption. From sowing to the flesh, there's a, reason, there's a meaning to it. Where are, you, where are you pumping your energy into? Where? The major problem, my message is not scatter, but it's good, let it scatter. Let it scatter. The major problem of today that God has is Christians that don't believe anything. It's Christians that believe in the flesh. They sow to the flesh. They don't make any choices that show that they believe in eternity. When you find them in church, they just will find the keys to prosperity. They come to use God to sow to the flesh. How do, how do we buy a new Mercedes Benz before December? We we'll sow. So all the seed sowing is for the Mercedes Benz we want to buy by December. So you see them in church, very dutiful, regular. They don't miss one service. They pay their tithes regularly. And pastors, because they are human beings, we love them. This brother is dedicated. They don't know all the church coming, all the offerings, all the God bless you, sir. All the intercession is seed into the flesh. All of it's being done so that God can feed my flesh. And if you are a pastor, you are listening to this, please stop that nonsense. God will soon add you to the sin. I hope you know that. Yes. One pastor said that, uh, I don't know what they are doing is wrong, but if they bring the seed, I will collect. There's no problem. Collect it. God will just join you to the judgment. That's all it is. You can't, as a pastor, be training Christians how to disobey. It's wrong. He said, if we don't pray that they will not give, let them not give. Let them not give. Let them not give. You can't be using flesh to motivate Christians to do what is right. If they do what is right, they are still sowing to the flesh. Hey, the Lord is good. Let me try and retrace my steps. Sometimes, you know, you know, some things are like fire in your bones. You have to say that so you can have some relief. I think I'm relieved now. How did I get to LGBTQQQTTT? I, I, I. How did I get there again? Anyway, so I was saying something. We are responsible. We believers. God holds the church responsible. God holds us responsible. We pastors have to be careful. We have to teach what is right. We are the reason why there's trouble, why there's trouble in the nation. If there's kidnapping, like I told you, I'm speaking prophetically into the nation. If there's kidnapping, God says who's responsible? He said, ask the Christians. The economy is not good. If the head of state cannot balance his budget, ask the Christians. If the police is doing what is not right, he says, ask the Christians. If the army cannot control the insurgency, God says, ask the Christians. If you see anything going wrong, educational system is wrong, ask the Christians. I hope you're getting my point. If anything is wrong in the country, he said, ask the Christians. I was explaining something. You find people debating. Churches start debating things like this. They are the problem in the nation. So if the world goes crazy, that's why I, that's why I went into that. If the world goes, goes crazy, it's okay. I'm not saying it's right, but God doesn't have a problem as long as the church does not follow them. As long as the church does not follow them. One of the reasons why Islam prospered in many countries in this world is because the church did not stand. Like you see all this, uh, should we 
Should we to uh, homosexual marriages? Should we marry, join a man to a man? Nobody ever discusses that with Muslims. Have you noticed that? They don't dis- Some of them practice it, though. But that is not a discussion they are ready to have. They rather blow you up and blow your parliament up than have that discussion. And everybody knows. So everybody keeps away. And for that reason, many Europeans found it easier. When, we're looking, when they were looking for direction, they found Islam easier because they seemed to have direction. The church did not seem to have it. When the church was discussing, should we ordain homosexual bishops? Muslims are not discussing it. I heard somebody, supposed Christian, saying that uh, Paul wrote what he wrote because he's an Old Testament guy. That if he's alive now, he won't write all the things he's writing in Romans chapter 1. And the church is having that discussion. Not in Nigeria. I think we don't have such discussions in Nigeria. And that's a sign that there's hope. Our own problem is still we steal money. <laughs> we tell lies. If we can remove those two, <laughs> we, are, we are very close to salvation, I'm telling you. We are very, very close to salvation. <laughs> if American church solves the problem of racism amongst them, racism will end in the United States. If African churches, Nigerian churches, solve the problem of tribalism, it will end outside. You know, that's our own problem. In the church, we practice tribalism. I heard of a church that split. I wanted the name of the church, one of these big protestant denominations, because they expected the next head to come from a particular state. That one came from Enugu. It was a ton of a boy. And that one did not happen. And something happened, something happened. They went and registered a new church. If the other church was called the Okemote International Assembly, that one now became the Reformed Okemote International <laughs> Assembly. You know, there are some things that God will not listen to any serious prayer. Those people pray for the rest of their lives. No, no, not because, you know, it's just like God says, listen, you're not serious. You can't even break over serious things. Like interpretation of, you know, maybe Hebrews chapter 4. You can break over that. I will understand that. So, but this one, both of you are doing wrong. You know what I'm preaching? I'll get to my main message, okay? <laughs> Everybody, there is, next time you insult, you tell, you insult the head of state or the governor of Enugu, just know you are a liar. Yes. You are putting the blame where it does not belong. No Christian in this our nation of today has any business criticizing the head of state for doing something that's not right. No Christian. We don't have it. If we cannot put our houses in order, what gives you the right to point our f- accusing f- fingers to a man who tells you he's a Muslim? Why should he have the grace to do right when you, that claim to be a believer, don't have it? Hypocrite. Where will he get it from? So people are saying that uh, he wants to marry a second wife. Bros is allowed as many wives as he can take care of. Four and thereabout. And if you get to number four, you drop number one. Then you rejoin from the other end. Ha <laughs> is it a problem? When your pastor is committing adultery. Do you get what I'm trying to say? When a man is there preparing Bible study and funding his student. Look, any Muslim is allowed to do any evil as long as we are doing our own. Because we have a claim to a higher level of grace. That's what, you know, something Christians don't understand. Look, as a body, we don't want to face the judgment of God the way things are. You'll be amazed at what He will do to us. You'll be amazed. You will be amazed. We, in this country, we are responsible for all the problems. The head of state, they can't do anything about it if the people that hold the power are not doing what is right. Who is it? Are you not the one that claim that you are claiming that you have grace? If as a church, sometimes I say, can come, they will come out to take a stand. I'll be laughing. I say, please, go and register your political party. Then we know we are doing politics here. Because some of these stands you are taking, that's not what God expects from you. Look, if I were can, I won't see anything publicly. I'll be writing rules of behavior for our inside people. And, the, and, and enforcing those rules in prayer. If you don't follow the rules of righteousness according to the word of God, you will lose your ministry. You will be disgraced openly. If you will not take correction, you will die. That will, the elders will sit down and say, did you collect campaign money? And say, hey, before you answer, they will read the story of Ananias and Sapphira. 
They say, man of God, before you answer, don't think we are joking. No. Now, did they give you money to share to pastors for campaign? When they read Anasas and Safira, and you still go and tell lies. You know, that one, there is no forgiveness. You may drop there, or you may go home, fall asleep, and not wake up. But the soul that sinned that sin, it shall die. And if you say, ah, my brethren, please, I'm sorry. Yes, I collected. How much? He says, one billion. Go and return it. He said, but I have spent some. Go and sell the house. Send all that you have and refund that money. And tell them that we don't campaign, we don't collect money to vote. It's our duty as citizens. We practice, we do our duties. Please don't represent us wrongly. And say, bros, you have 24 hours to refund the rest of the money that is with you. And one week to sell all you have. We will we'll forgive you of the balance if you are completely poor. Maybe you know some of you gone, you've gone to drink champagne. Half a million a bottle. We can't turn your urine now to <laughs> money. <laughs> you know when people have gone crazy, they do all kinds of strange things. So that kind of situation. In fact, we won't, even, we won't forgive you the balance. We will not levy ourselves. Yeah, all you've drank and smoked. You know, because you went on cocaine for two weeks. Because plenty of money can make you do drugs. You don't know that? Ah, I don't want to teach you that one yet. Plenty of money has a spirit. So all the one you need to buy cocaine, the weak, your brethren, will not levy ourselves, give it back to you. To go and refund. And you go to either APC or PDP or UPN, whatever be the name of the party. And say, please, my brethren, say, take your money they don't want to vote for us. They say they don't make statements on who their people will vote for. They teach righteousness. Please leave them alone. I hope you're getting my point. That is all we should be doing. That's all we should be doing. Instead of making political statements on headsmen. Please, I hope you're following my point. Well, let's sit on our message. So, we are held responsible for all the things. That's what I'll be talking about. Let's bear that in mind. Therefore, if you are responsible, you understand... You cannot just run away from your responsibility. If things are wrong in the country, God is speaking to us. I made a statement last time. The last time, you know, economic downturn came into the country again, I am convinced that the church was responsible. And what the church needs to do is to repent of her ways. The church is supposed to lead men in the way of doing righteousness. They are supposed to lead. Now, we read um, from this Isaiah chapter 30, we began to see it last time. So individually... How do we solve our problems as believers, as children of God? How do we solve the problem in our lives? How do we plan? Let's get to this straight. For the destiny of our children. He said, you must not, listen to this, you must not ever make alliances that's not by my spirit. What does it mean by my spirit? It does not mean to go and sleep and to go and pray until God speaks to you in your dream. Or you hear a voice, we said last time. Your voice, the voice you hear, is only as good as your heart is pure. Therefore, if Balaam hears God say, you can go, it doesn't mean anything because Balaam wanted to go. That was why he came. And the fact that his heart was going after the, 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 the unjust gain made what he heard irrelevant. But if a man had had the right heart and unjust gain was not in his, you know, in his heart at all, and he wasn't thinking about what he would get, and whether God spoke to him or not, he would have done what was right, and for that reason, he would have been blessed. So when God said, woe to him, those who make, who execute a plan that is not mine, and who make an alliance, but not of my spirit. That's what he was saying. What is your spirit? Now when God says, who execute a plan that is not mine, you must bear this in mind. God has a plan for solving every problem. God has a plan for solving every problem of, the, of his people. He has his own plan. So when you want to solve a problem, what you must do is so go and pray and say, God, what is your own plan in this area? Once I had to counsel with one of our, you know, one of our brethren, and I, you know, by the time I heard everything he was trying to do, you know, solving, you know, um, okay, let's say having problems with um, finance as an example or business, and I had all the plans. How do I solve this? How do I solve that? Suddenly I had an understanding. I said, you know what your problem is? You are trying to solve a spiritual problem. 
through carnal means. Did you hear what I said? Sometimes we are guilty of it. We are trying to solve a spiritual problem through carnal means. Let me explain this to us again. Please, if you can, if you can because I will not be able to go into it in details. If you can, get, a, get your hand on the message, what's wrong with a king? Let me, please go and listen to it. But let me just summarize it again to explain what I'm trying to say. Israel demanded for a king at the time. Can you remember that? And God was displeased. And the Lord said to Samuel, they have not rejected you, they have rejected me. Then once I was reading my Bible, and I found out that God had made provision for Israel to have a king, actually. All right? He had given instructions. Moses wrote clear-cut instructions down for when the matter of kingship would come up. So I, I asked myself, what was wrong with having a king? After all, God blessed David. He chose David as a king by himself for, for them. So the question that what was wrong with them asking for a king and then one day I read, my, I read my Bible, I found out what the problem was. For time's sake, we just summarize it. I taught it extensively in that message. So what's wrong with the king? But what was wrong with the king was simple. At that time, they were being harassed. There was a king there, in one of the neighboring kingdoms that was harassing them. You know, he would plunder their land, you know, raid their villages and all of that. And what they did not have was a standing army. Israel, if you remember Gideon, Gideon wants to raise an army to face the Midianites. He will have to call for volunteers. And in those days, a king was not just, you know, it was not the president. It was literally a commander-in-chief. And I don't mean commander-in-chief wearing, you know, mufti. And we meant that if they are going to war, he was a military general. He stood in front of the battle. He had to be somewhere in the battle. He did not just stay at home. When David stayed at home, when his men were fighting, he, he saw Bathsheba. So to prevent Bathsheba sighting, normally kings would have to go to battle. It was a normal thing. The Bible said that time he saw Bathsheba, it was at the time that kings went out to war. Kings were supposed to be in battle. So what Israel was asking for was not just the king, not the way we are looking at king, you know, the uh, you know, uh, 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 Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles. That's not what they were talking about. They were talking about a commander-in-chief who will lead their men to battle. They were talking about a standing army. If you see what they warned about, he's going to conscript all your men into his army. That was the issue. So basically, they were asking for an army and a leader of the army. Now, again, what's wrong with an army? They used to have armies once in a while, you will say. Yes, what was wrong was the reason. Because God had instituted things like this for Israel. If you please me, I will give you peace round about. If you disobey me, your enemies will come into your land. It was simple. I hope you're getting my point. He said, I have the power to keep enemies off. And I can call them from far to come and afflict you. The issue is that, are you keeping my commandments? Are you offering the right sacrifices or not? So when problem came upon them at that point, particular point in time, what happened was that they had rejected all the counsel. They said, why do we have trouble? It's because our government is bad. Why do we have trouble? It's because APC is in power, or PDP is in power. So we'll vote out APC, and we'll vote in, no, we'll vote out PDP, and vote in APC. Why do we have trouble? It's because Christians can't come together and support a candidate. Why, do, can you see, I'm trying to tell you how Israel was reasoning, they, you know, using our own modern way now. You understand? So they were reasoning like that. Because sometimes it's very easy for us to point fingers. Israel asks for a king. As if we are not asking for a king. But we ask for kings every day, the way Israel did. So, they saw the source of their problems as the thing they could see. So they said, let us solve it. Let us solve this problem. How do we solve it? Get a standing army. And get a man in charge. And that was why Saul gave them, uh, God gave them Saul who was an exact, please, you must understand this. Be careful what you are wishing for. It was an exact picture of what they had in their minds. Saul's stature was what they wanted. I don't, are you getting my point? They were not looking for a man that would lead them in righteousness. They were looking for a man that was strong and could fight. And the moment Saul showed up, yes, Saul was God's choice, you will say. But really, he wasn't. What I mean, what I mean is that, Saul was chosen according to the idol in their hearts. God could see their hearts. So he brought from their hearts the idol which showed up as Saul. Because spiritual things can take on flesh. 
So God looked and said, this spiritual state these men are in, what will it manifest as? So he looked up and down and found the tallest man in the land. The Bible says it was a head, you know, it was, from the shoulder upward, it was taller than everybody else. So they said, God, this is our God is too good. He knows exactly what we are looking for. And you know what happened? Immediately he got results. He mobilized men and began to go into battle. And immediately he started conquering the, I think it was the Ammonites. Instantly he overcame the king. He, ah, and everybody said, wow, this is the man. Just by the way, when God brought his own king, his own king was not tall, was not muscular. When Samuel saw him, Samuel looked like, is this a joke or what? Because he got there, he saw Eliab. Eliab reminded him of Saul. He said, surely the Lord's anointed is right here before us. And God said, you see, that's a problem. You are thinking the way they thought. I am looking for a man after my heart. Not who will deliver them from trouble. No, who will do all my desires. Saul was a different, uh, David was a different order of a king. Now, please follow my point. So what was wrong with the king was that this man felt that if we can arrange our army, so anytime you have your own explanation, that's why I started last week with the way I started, trying to explain the fact that life is spiritual. If you are poor, it has nothing to do with your education. So you don't return to school to go and study to solve a financial problem. You don't do that. It has nothing to do <clears throat> with your education. And these people I've interacted with personally, the man I mentioned you know, some time ago, he's the richest person I have met personally. He was being interviewed on TV the other day. They called him the billionaire. Um, they called him BBE. Bishop. Bishop Evangelist. Thank you. That's what they called him. So, but the man told me simply that he didn't go beyond secondary school, uh, primary school. I stopped going to school in primary six. I hope you're getting my point. Ali Kodangote is not the most educated Nigerian. You know that's a matter of fact. Or am I deceiving myself? It's a matter of fact. The point I'm going to make is this. So someone will say that the reason, you know, I remember <laughs> Tunde Bakari told a story that he had an elder brother. Or oh, he has. I, I heard him preach this long ago. And his brother, um, Tunde Bakari was from a polygamous home. His father had many wives. And his father died early. So he was a little boy when his father died. But he has his elder brother. And of course, over time, God blessed Tunde Bakari. He went to Lagos. He used to go from house to house washing clothes for people. You understand? Yes. In fact, the day I heard him say it on TV, he pointed to one of the deaconesses in the church. He said, that, was I not washing clothes for you and your husband? The woman was not a deaconess in the church. And he was their wash. Or, 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 what do you call people like that? Uh, not laundry man. I use biggie English. Washer man. <laughs> Which one is laundry man? Uh, laundry man. Best boy. Boy, they come house, come wash. They call the laundry man dry cleaner. Somebody even said dry cleaner. <laughs> Person they pour water is a dry cleaner. <laughs> so it was a washer boy. He used to come around wash. And what he said is that he would go to one house, wash, then start, go back again. He'd go from one house to the other. By the time he's done with the last house washing, clothes have dried in the first one. He starts ironing. That's how you know he struggled and all of that. He went to school, became a lawyer. I right, became a Christian somewhere along the line, became a pastor. God blessed him financially, and he's very uh, financially, you know, he's made. Now, so he said his, his, bro- his elder brother will come to him, half brother, actually, okay? That's not born of the same mother. And come to ask him, oh, please, school fees time, or can you help? Man of God will give him some money. This one time, can you help? He'll give you some money. So anytime he will come, he'll be complaining that, hmm, he's suffering like this because his father died early. Sometimes foolishness is a terrible thing. It will not even reveal itself to you. <laughs> that you are being foolish. Nubakar said he's always been very patient. He you just keep quiet as if he didn't hear what the man said. I'm giving you money. Just take the money and go. No need for this story. The man will come again. Talk, talk, talk. So Nubakar will find money and give the man. And the man will say, thank you. Hmm. All of this, if only my father had lived to be able to tra- train me to a good level. So the next time he came, as he brought up the matter... He couldn't hold himself anymore. He shouted and said, look, was your father not my father? <laughs> if this is your excuse, will hold. Why is he not holding in my life? After all, you experienced more of him than I did. You, you lived with him for much longer. 
God has trained me over the last few years to observe all of those things. Every explanation you have for why something is succeeding, for why it is failing, all the explanations, at least in my life, God has been careful to confound them. If you say this business did well because it is here, you now try to replicate, replicate it elsewhere. God will just say, give me my blessing. You collect it and hold it. Do it, use location. You will find out that the Bible says, except the Lord builds a house. They labor in vain that build it. It's, it's vain labor. You only do things after God has poured his blessing upon it. Israel, that was a problem they had when God was angry that asked for a king. He said, why are you being attacked by the Ammonites? Why is this king harassing you? He says, because you, had, you have displeased me. And listen to this, they did not address that. They refused to address it. They kept on insisting. It is because the man is strong and we are weak. It's because he has an army and we don't have an army. When they explained that to Samuel, Samuel went to God. God said, don't worry about it. It is me they have rejected, not you. That is, if you had spent time, energy, to call a holy convocation, and everybody would repent, that man, I would have killed him in his house and sent a wasting disease amongst his soldiers. He would not have come near your borders again, but he said we will not have any of it. I hope you're getting my point. That was what he said through Isaiah. In returning and in rest, you will be saved. Listen, that was the problem. God said, look, woe to the rebellious children who executes a plan but not mine. Saul was a kind of plan that, that is having a king was a plan they executed that was not God's plan. What God used to do was that if they would seek him, and this is the interesting part. I hope you know that king, that king matter did not help them. Oh, it didn't help. It seems to help for a while. At the end of the day, we're back to square one. The only difference now is that they now had one man who could lead them into sin. And once in a while, they have a king that will lead them into righteousness. But most times, especially for northern Israel, almost every time they had bad kings. You know Israel broke into two. You know that. All right. After the death of Solomon, Jeroboam held the northern kingdom. Rehoboam held the southern kingdom made up of Judah. Basically, Judah alone. Benjamin was there, but Benjamin had been reduced to a tiny size. So they were the, that's why the name just became Judah. You understand? There was a time they almost wiped out all the Benjaminites. Okay? So, is the Judah managed to have a few good kings. But almost all through, the main Israel had bad, bad kings. And that, those kings did not help both up in the north and down in the south. David had it for a while. But listen, David was a good man in himself. And that's why the Bible, in fact, the, the men said it. When he went to battle at a particular time, they said, you are not coming to battle again, lest the light of Israel be quenched. David was a righteous man as far as God was concerned under their dispensation. And for that reason, he poured the blessing to the land. As soon as he died, almost every king they had after was useless. That is, the thing they should have solved from the beginning, which they did not solve, kept on afflicting them all the days of their lives. Until finally, the two kingdoms disappeared almost entirely. Before Jesus came, Northern Israel did not exist anymore. The Assyrians had taken them away. Then the southern kingdom, Babylon came and collected them. It was years later that Darius, Cyrus, and that, that gang of people allowed them to go back and go and rebuild. When you hear of Samaria, in fact, that's a long story. Let's not even start, start talking about it. Northern kingdom Israel was Samaria. But by, that, by the time Jesus was there, there were such a mixture of all kinds of people that the Jews that were remaining refused to recognize them as their brethren. What am I saying? Getting a king did not, so, they did not solve their problem ultimately. Every solution, every problem in life has a divine solution. And divine solutions are spiritual. Let me say that again. Divine solutions are spiritual. I told that, um, uh, the, that the person I was counseling with that day, I said, look, you are trying to solve a spiritual problem through physical means. You are trying to get Saul on your side. You are trying to get a king 
when your real problem is rebellion in the spirit. Let me say something to Christians again. Anytime there's a problem, before you, uh, by the way, leave the devil out for a moment. When there's a problem, please, what did I say? You don't sound convinced, though. Leave him out for a moment. He's not your problem. I don't know how many times I need to say this before the whole world believes it. The whole church, that's what I mean, all over the world. Your enemy is only as strong as your relationship with God is weak. Satan has very few jobs. He, can, he does. Number one is temptation, deception. Just keep away from those two things. And he's not a problem to you. Temptation. He comes to tempt. Like I said last time, God does not accept excuses for iniquity. Satan will explain and offer you all kinds of excuses. He will say to Jesus, turn these stones to bread. You know you are hungry and you have the power. I always like to drop a word for preachers. And now I know why I need to do that because they are, the, both, they are both the problem and the solution. You know what I'm going to say? Hmm. See this pulpit? Okay, I don't mean the literal wooden pulpit. Now, I mean the fact that you have authority. There's a reason why God gave it to you. And that simple reason is to teach people righteousness, to correct them, to lift Jesus up in their eyes. That is all. It does not solve your personal problems. It's not when you people have finished meeting a council of uh, pastors. You want to build a church. Nothing wrong with building a church, though. This, this, there's something wrong. You now say, God said to you to build the church. God did not say. You need... Look, God hardly tells people to build anything. That's the thing I made. I, I, I will repeat it again. I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. One, 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 one big denomination, one brother said, <laughs> I said, I hear your church is building this kind of thing. One massive thing like this. He says, the man that knows what God told you, I said, my friend, get away. God didn't tell him anything. <laughs> Finally, he confessed to me. You know what he confessed to me? He said, Bishop, he called for me like that. He said, let them build it. I said, why? He said, the money is too much. That if they don't build it, they will eat it. That's what he said. I said, oh, God did not speak again. I said, God never tells people to build. I didn't say never. Hardly is what I said. Hardly. Hardly. If you, if you have money and you want to build a house, go ahead. I said, God said to me, leave that thing out. Pastor, leave it out. Many times, what we are hearing is the pride of life. I've been in ministry for the last 18 years. You think, this church that started, Chris came to the other, decided the church. Look at their size of the auditorium now. You now want to build your own. You now come to this place and be telling us that God said. If anybody tells me that these days, I won't, let me forget, I won't even answer him. There's no need, there's no need to react. I'm not saying it's wrong to build. That's it so. If you have the money, do it. Don't harass anybody so. This is not the place you come and solve your personal fights. You are some dickens, you have a problem. You now come, your message for this Sunday is rebellion. I want to tell you the story about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Hallelujah. We need to learn about the leprosy of Miriam. Hmm. Somebody say Miriam and leprosy. <laughs> Even though what Moses did may have been wrong, it is not Miriam that will challenge Moses. Search not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. That is not why they gave you pulpit bros. If you want to fight the deacons, tell them to meet you at indoor sports hall. You understand my point? Bring gloves. There's no problem. Lock the door. Wear your gloves. Oh yeah. Who won't rack me for there? Fight your deacons. <laughs> In the gymnasium. Don't bring it to the pulpit. That is not a fair fight. You know, they don't have a pulpit. Yeah. A lot of pastors do that thing. They use this pulpit to harass everybody. Oh, shall I mention it again? Pastor, they don't sell anything from here. Two of our brothers have started a business and they said that anything, um, one quarter of their profit is coming, to, is coming to church, so if you patronize them, you are building the kingdom. I hope you know it's iniquity you are just promoting. The brothers known, and that's why they made that promise. You don't sell anything from the pulpit. 
There's one pastor in Tower and Delta State. They would introduce him. Uh, pastor, let's look for a, let's look for a common Delta name. Find me a Delta, a common Delta name. Okay, Pastor Efe, thank you very much. Pastor Efe, let's welcome Pastor Efe. Hmm. This route is from China. <laughs> the guy will appear daily on television with a title pastor to sell us uh, a go. <laughs> I look at some men, I say, you don't fear God. If God injures you now, you will say it's Satan. It's not Satan. You don't sell anything from here. This was given to you. There's a lot of power that comes with this pulpit. Do you understand? Almost everything I tell you to do, apart from a few rebellious souls, you know, they're always in church, no matter what you do. Even King Lord, they will come. If they say amen, they're looking at you, say, for what? (laughs) Apart from a few rebellious souls, most people will do what you tell them. And anytime you have power like that, be careful how you use it. Be very careful how you use it. The Lord is good. I just feel like dropping that. If you're a minister and you're listening to this, be very, very careful. Don't turn your stones to bread. Anyway, back to what I was saying. So Satan comes to give us explanations on why we should disobey God. I was explaining, listen, the solution to problems for believers, they are always spiritual. You always have to look for the spiritual solution. That day when I was counseling, I said, listen, you cannot solve your physical problems uh, your spiritual problems through physical means. And next thing, many times for us believers, our physical problems are signals of a spiritual problem. The problem a lot of times that Christians all only look at problems as in when I say spiritual problem, they mean that uh, what sin did I commit? Whose wife did I collect? Whose money did I take? Sometimes you took somebody's money. Sometimes you want to take somebody's wife in quotes. But that's not all there is to it. Sometimes it's a matter of ignorance. Like I said last time, there's a level of truth God expects us to walk in. There's a level of truth God expects believers to walk in. There are times God allows problems. Not only allows, sins. Yes, he does sometimes. Just to call your attention. Just to call your attention. Listen, we are God's children. And children are not fully grown yet. That's why they are called children. We are in different stages of maturity. Foolishness is bound up in our hearts just like that. And just like an earthly father, the heavenly father also has to tease out those things and periodically expose things to us and correct us. So many times problems are there just to bring our attention to a spiritual matter. That's why I said, leave Satan out for a moment. Once I meditated, the Bible says that Jesus went around healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And I began to ask myself, wait, why those were oppressed of the devil? There's a long teaching about that. Because there's something that converts affliction to oppression. Because before it's converted into oppression, there's what the Bible calls the just recompense of reward for disobedience. I'll explain it. For example, Jesus would not have healed somebody who is under affliction for disobedience, except, first of all, there is baptism. And John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for what? The forgiveness of sins. That was why Jesus did not heal everybody. One reason. And that was why John had to go ahead of him. Please, if, 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 if time allows me, I will explain that further. But the point I want to emphasize is this. So when you have troubles a lot of times, it's, it's an indicator. You know those things in, in chemistry, they taught us about indicators. Remember phenolphthalein? How many of you did chemistry? Have they changed the indicator now? You know indicators change? I, I don't know. Do they still use phenolphthalein and methyl blue? Is it or methyl red? There's one that was red. Methyl orange. Anyway, they had those things. Now, they were not the chemical reactions per se. You just put a drop inside the reaction so that when your pH crosses a particular level, it changes color. Material things, physical things, they are indicators for us of spiritual reactions. And that was why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, don't worry about what you shall eat, what you shall drink, and with what shall you clothe yourselves. 
He said, your heavenly father knows that you need these things. So he said, seek first the kingdom of God. What was he trying to explain? If you find deficiencies in your, in your life in certain areas, what you are supposed to do is go into the spirit. Now when I'm talking about spirit, I don't mean jump into somewhere spiritual. I just mean like, go and pray. Take the scriptures. Take the word of God. Start studying. And don't assume. That's another thing. We have a, we have a likelihood, it's a ten, it's a human thing, to assume you are right. When actually you may be wrong. The fact that you have done everything right. You know, Job was very right. He was so right, all the teachers available on the earth who knew righteousness could not explain to him he was wrong. Eliphaz talked. All his friends spoke. They could not persuade Job. Until Eli opened his mouth and began to explain something to Job. We'll talk about that briefly, maybe, in a moment. But the point is this. Job was right. But you see, God expects his people to move from one level to another. You cannot be the same person this year that you were last year or 10 years ago. I read an article long ago titled, On What Do I Stand? And I realized that as you grow older as a Christian, the understanding of the spiritual you have must increase. Otherwise, you will get into trouble spiritually. There are some prayer methods I can't use now. I can't. It becomes iniquity for me. Meanwhile, those days in school, we were studying. That was what faith was. Like I said, you draw something on the wall. What exactly are you asking God for? You put it on the wall, and you look at it. Now I know it's idolatry. That time, God answered some of those prayers. Though. And it created confusion. People wrote books on it works. That's why now I don't believe it works. It doesn't matter. Even if it doesn't work, if it is right, it doesn't matter. Once it's right. And if it works, if it is wrong, it doesn't matter too. It's true. How do we know it's right? The word of God. There is insight. There's an, you know, Eli will say something. There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty gives him understanding. There's a way you read your Bible, you know something's right. Whether it works or not, it's not the point we're making. But also, those days, we prayed in a particular way. As time went on, we began to read the Bible and say, ah, no. As young boys, of course, young boys, we have fantasies. And they told, you know, so you, of course, as a young guy, you know one day you're going to marry. Which kind of woman do you want to marry? The right. I know as young as you were, because you were young, which meant you were foolish. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. yes. Foolishness is not a bad word in that sense. It just means you are ignorant. You don't know what matters in life. You know that. So all the pictures you could draw of life is based on the movies you have watched. You don't know the things that matter. You have to do. You all could only draw according to the current trend. And I remember there's a particular movie, and that movie was stuck in my head. So if you had to draw a wife, you had to fit the Egyptian women we saw in that particular movie. They were Egyptian. Yeah, they were Egyptian women. Standing next to Egyptian princes. Actually, it was Ten Commandments. I know it's a movie. Everybody looking so nice. You know? So when you had to think of who you marry, you had to be an Egyptian princess. And I can imagine heaven, they are laughing. He said, Lord, Banky wants to marry Nefertiti. <laughs> God said, Levi, Levi, Levi. Nefertiti is called Cleopatra. <laughs> but are you getting my point? As we began to grow older, I realized that then, forget those doctrines. God allowed us to use it for shirts, for trousers. Why? We're children. He said, at least we love the Lord. We're trying to pray. And as we began to grow older, we hear that, don't worry about what you shall eat, you shall drink, or you shall be clothed. And we began to read scriptures that Adam was asleep when God formed Eve. Eve. Adam had no idea. That he did not even know what a wife looked like until he saw Eve. But when he saw Eve, he understood. So we began to understand, tear off all those ideas, remove them from the wall. We began to understand, as time went on, you get my point, that you don't make your choice of a mate. It's God that makes it. You only make a discovery. God makes it. You make a discovery. So prayer had to change. Prayer would now be, Lord, remove everything from my eyes that will not help me, do not allow me to recognize the day Eve will come. That's it. Remove things from my eyes. So do you get my point? Understanding changes the way you pray. Those days they said, ah, I, I, I remember we've been taught about vision, vision. How many people do you want in this church by next year? You will, this year, you will share with your co-workers. 
And then your workers will understand. And you guys are 150 this year. By next year, you're going to be 500. And you, you know, you, you, you let them see it. You hire, you buy more seats to seat 500 people. And, 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 and you begin to declare it every morning. You declare it every night. The next year, we're going to be 500. And then we believe those things, those days. Trust me, I never practiced in Kingdom World Ministries. Amen? Now, after a while, I read the story of Jesus. I read the story of John. And he said, a man can receive nothing except is given to him from above. The one that Jesus shared revelation, church became 12. A church of thousands of people. It came down to 12 people. <laughs> I looked and I said, eh. The large number does not always mean anything, no. I saw that there are times Jeremiah would pray, God said, relax, stop praying. Even if like, go and call Moses and someone, I, I will not listen. Ah. I checked something that sometimes God actually has few people in a particular place. They will begin to read some things that Young Cho said, eh, okay, he had, eh, he had a vision for one million. And we realized that those visions were birthed by the Spirit. They were not his desires. Because later on we found out that there's what they call the, the church called the Assemblies of God. They are labeled for generations before him. They had watered the place. We found out what Jesus meant when he said that other men labeled, but you have not entered into their labor. That depends on where you come. Some come as planters. Some come as harvesters. If you're a planter, stop this rubbish vision of one million people in your church. It's not going to happen. You know why? There are not one million believers out there yet. So your vision will be different. Plant as much as possible. A generation will come that will come and harvest. After that, no prayer has changed. Though. And we heard all kinds of doctrines. That if you feed people well, they will come. I say, hey, forget it. There's no guarantee. God helped us to understand that each person is sent by the Lord. An angel will say, you go to church. We also came to understand that if you insist upon your way, God will give it to you. So God says, look, bros, relax. There are not 10,000 Christians that can come to your church in this city. He said, why not? God can do everything. God said, no problem. I will do anything, everything. He will bring all the 500 people that should come and give you 9,500 unbelievers that look Christian. They look Christian. They will come to church. Then your troubles have started. And all the women working for you will be tempters. All the men will be thieves. Your church account will never balance one day. As they are giving offering, you just come to the offering basket. You just know that there's no 1,000 there. No, they're all the offering money is 5,500, 100, 100, 50 naira. Ah! Then one day you start praying and praying and praying. Now find your most trusted deacon is a crook. Judas is his uncle. Say, Lord, what is going on? He said, hey, you wanted 10,000. That's what I could find. Before you know what's happening, your messages will be watered down. Because every time you preach a good word, offering will go down. After a while, you will talk to yourself. Because to manage a, look, to manage a 10,000 sitter auditorium, it costs money. Of course, you have to air condition it, everything. So one day you preach, you can't be giving bribes. You are polluting the land. Then that the, the count offering is one quarter of what was like, happen, what happened last time. How ah, you ask your, 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 your wife, say, what happened? Say, most of that money is those guys that used to give it. When you preach like that, they don't give. They are convicting them. There are pastors who go to the pulpit. And I'm telling you the truth. They said, I must preach a good message so that the offering will be plenty. If you have that mindset, you will control what you say. You don't want men to feel bad. You will not preach against unrighteousness. And all of this started because you insisted God had to give you your 10,000 people. And it's in the Bible like that. God gave them meat according to their lust. But what happened? He sent leanness into their souls. So if you harass God until he gives you what you want, leanness comes with it. Now, I'm explaining something here. So you see, we keep increasing in understanding. Gone are the days when they say, you need a new car. Tell God the exact kind of car you want. I said, I don't do such things anymore. Why don't I do it? I realize it is foolishness. Why is it foolishness? It is simple. You can only ask God for the car you have seen. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And such a man will do what? Receive nothing from God. So because as soon as you go out tomorrow, you see another car. So if God does not bring the car in three months, you will have changed your mind five times. 
I said, no, I will not change my mind. Obviously, you are not advancing technologically. Because if you were, you should change your mind. Newer cars are coming out. Better final ones are coming out. It's not ungodly to change your mind. It's just that you do not get anything from God. <laughs> I've seen one brother, he announced to us, let me use today's cars, that he has a new Camry. It's not Camry, this was years ago. He declared and declared and declared. So we said, where's the car? He said, you see it. We did not know it was, he was suffocating by faith. The one day I was now with him, he said, he now realized that he missed God. There's no a Camry, it's an Avalon. I said, okay. <laughs> After that, I understood that I was declaring by faith there was no car anywhere. Oh, the car was in heaven, like he said, so let's leave it there. So now we pray about such things. We say, God, look, you know what I need? You know what is best for me? What I, what I can understand is I would like to have a comfortable right to move from one place to the other to do the will of God in my life. I leave the details to you, God. I won't try to be smart. People say, you're not walking by faith. That is the faith I understand. Because you, you're, you must not be double-minded. And so what is lack of double-mindedness? I'll tell you. Being single-minded in this situation is that I've read my Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's all. Let me live for a million years. I can't change that one. If you like, change from the time of Model T Ford. So you are now driving Tesla Model S. The cars that don't look alike, they don't behave the same way, apart from the fact that they move you about. There's next to nothing common in them. That word will still not change. I hope you're getting my point here. Now, listen to this. Another point I should make. If you are not making this spiritual advancement in understanding, God says you are walking in sin. That is, you, at a particular level, you cannot be praying certain prayers. Now, I will not stay up all night or we're talking about night. Wake up or pray for 10 minutes on personal needs like I need a car, I need a house. No. I, let, I stopped that years ago because I realized that God doesn't want me discussing such things. So what we need to pray now is for more serious matters. I'm explaining something here. To advance us from one level to another spiritually, God allows problems to wake us up. Yes. That is why you don't solve problems first with material things. You must take time out to pray until you have solved the spiritual aspect. Otherwise, you dig yourself further into a hole. You are looking for money. You looking for God. Say, listen, you don't understand. Your attitude towards money is the problem. So please, go and pray until I correct that attitude. So, I was talking to my wife. Was it yesterday night or this morning? I said, I just realized that one thing that God is doing to his children, me, part of it, but one of them, of course, at least for my own life, I said, God just wants us to remove our eyes as if from a place where we are thinking as if money is the source of things. So for me, if I do anything because of money, he will refuse to bless it. Just refuse to bless it. He will just refuse. I gave you an example of how once I, a brother said he needed our messages. Ah, and that we're sending the CDs. Okay, of course, you know the way it is. These are not really free. So that one I said, ah, let me, this was not to recent, this is long ago when I did everything, basically, just, you know, just me. So, I went and produced all the CDs and gave to me. He wanted, his CD was a hundred naira. He wanted 50, say 50 is 1,000, 5,000, right? At a hundred naira. It's my father mass, correct? If somebody gives you 5,000, how many CDs is that? At a hundred, hundred naira. The YDS, if you don't, turn A plus, uh, Anyway, 50. So I bought a pack of CDs. I spent time, bought all the CDs. And I was feeling very happy, like, yes, this ministry this makes more money from preaching. And they gave me the 5,000 and an envelope. And that was the last time I saw it, when they gave it to me. Nobody slapped me. I, I didn't go anywhere that I said, no, I, I could then remember exactly where I went. Until now, I can't remember. I went to the post office. It's the only place I came down before I started looking for the money. And the 5,000 and an envelope vanished. You may not realize it, but I have an angel that takes my things. The guy has stolen from me at least three times. That I can remember. I know the painful part. This angel can't spend money. He can't wear my clothes. Yeah, he will take them. Four times now, I remember. I remember the fourth time. The fourth one was the one night. Somebody said, prove me now. I go prove God now. The angel... <laughs> That angel, very funny guy. <laughs> One day I will see him. I will discuss these things. <laughs> Just went to where I kept my clothes and removed them from the line. And you know what he does with them? I don't know. I suspect he dashes them to people. 
I suspect he does that. Just give my things out to people. The guy just entered my car that day. Say, where the pastor came 5,000? He removed it. That was the end of it. I didn't get angry. I got the lost point. Don't treat this word. So if you see me, you can download for free. It's not only through the other, the other things that the Lord has used to explain it. Say, Banky, this is not for sale, Lord. I say, yes, sir. Say, if you need money, pray, I will send. Let me testify. He does send. Let me testify. He sends. So you see, every time in life, how do we solve problems? God takes us from one level of revelation to another. And listen, you cannot be hanging on the same understanding you were using 15 years ago, 20 years ago. You are supposed to grow. And if you are not growing, now I started by saying that when we talk about spiritual problems, people think that this is uh, adultery, uh, stealing. No. Sometimes just refusal to advance spiritually is a problem. Just refusal to advance spiritually. That's why believers, listen, taking time out to go and learn the word is a, is a commandment. It's a commandment from heaven for you. Jesus said, there are things I want to tell you, but you can't bear them now. That is, this year, there are things you are learning. Jesus said, there are levels I want to take you to. You have to cross 300 levels. That thing is 700 level material. But it's saying to you, by the end of 2022, you must have learned it. So between now and in the next three years, you must have accumulated enough spiritual understanding to cover 300 level, 400 level, 500 level, 600 level. Sometimes Satan uses money and business to distract you from spiritual advancement. You have to be careful. If you start one business, it fails. Second one, it fails. Third one is not doing well. Close all of them down and go and pray for three, three, week, three weeks or so. Sometimes God needs to tell you, listen. I mean, remember the story we told about um, Demos Shakari? We went into green speculation, commodity speculation. God just looked and said, this boy doesn't get the point. He almost wipes himself out of business. Enter into contracts that was going to kill his business permanently. All kinds of things went wrong in his life. Finally, he went to go and pray. God, what is going on? The Lord said, clearly. There are times God will speak to you clearly. He said, this one you are doing, I did not send you. Ah, how do I get out? Please, help me get out. I said, no problem. He sent a man who called him and bought a failing business of him. And the business prospered in the other man's hand. Listen, prosperity is a gift of God. It's not like you are smart. It's not like you are smart. I told you that, that Bishop Balisi told me. that say I've worked hard in this life, but everything that I have, my efforts cannot account for up to 5%. He said there are times you plan and plan and plan and plan. Business does not do so well. So there are times you plan, you think it will do just small. He said the thing starts doing so well. He said it has to be God. I hope you're getting my point in, in the things I'm saying. So you see, Prosperity is not, it's not your effort, it's a gift of God. So sometimes, when God withholds it, you have to be careful. There are times, you know, Christians, I think part of our problem is that we are too Satan focused. We are too Satan focused. Every little thing, Satan does not want him to prosper. Who is he? He has never wanted you to prosper, so your case is not unique. There's nothing unique about it. You know, sometimes we feel this self righteous this ungodly pride. Satan is after me as if, you know, I'm the next savior of the world, so he wants to kill me at best. So my mother had to carry me around to, and, uh, to Egypt. And you have to say it with pride. Yeah, and I was like, Satan said I will not do well. And I have to say, Satan said I will be sick. Satan, look, Satan is looking like, say, oh boy, I get power. You, you know those who praise Satan the most? Christians. Let us start worshipping the Lord, then we'll start worshipping the devil. You know why? After singing two songs of praise. In fact, even... You know, let me say something. Stop, stop. There are songs, there are songs that have too much Satan in them. There's too much Satan in them. Satan, he don't lose. Oh, quata, quata. Satan, he don't lose. Oh, quata, quata. Satan, he don't lose. And you think that you are celebrating victory. No, you are making, you, 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 you utter Satan, 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 Satan. All the children are now going around looking for Satan. Where did he fall? Where did he fall? You know? <laughs> Exalt Jesus, please. You understand? And leave it there. Let, the, let your, you know, just occasional reference to 
the fact that Satan is under your feet. But please, and remember, when you say Satan is under your feet, it's not that your money. It's temptation. It's temptation. I saw one video the other day. I had a very good laugh. You know, after all this one, the University of Lagos, you know, the sacking lecturers, suspending lecturers, church is suspending pastor, you know, stuff like that. And I showed one man driving past. One girl now greeted him. He now went down. He said, Satan, shame unto you. <laughs> he said, <laughs> He said, get behind me. I am covered by the blood of Jesus. And he drove off. That is revelation. <laughs> he said, now nah, I will not be tempted again. That is what Satan is all this Satan Satan thing. Can we magnify Satan every time? The devil, the devil, the devil. You can't be doing that. I hope you're getting my point here. So, one thing doesn't work, one other thing doesn't work. Let's stop glorifying the devil. We go home and go and pray. And say, God, what is going on? I hope you're getting my point. That was what Israel was supposed to do. That was what they were supposed to do. God was saying to Israel, both the time of Samuel and this Isaiah, He said, these guys, you are having problems. So what is your solution? Say, we'll run to Egypt. Ha! Ah, you will run to Egypt. You know, sometimes... Please, so, I pray, well, I can't refuse to say what I'm supposed to say. But sometimes I don't want to appear as if I'm attacking people. When I see the effort Christians put into some things like emigration, delivering children abroad and all of that, and I'll be looking at them like, do you believe in God? I have never been able to come to you and say, please, oh, give us a million naira to preach the gospel. Yet you will find 10 million naira to relocate. We've never been able to come to you and say, please give us uh, 200,000, 500,000 to help the needy and preach the gospel. You will not have. Then you will find 5 million because your wife is pregnant to go and deliver. And you are asking, where is your faith? Meanwhile, this same delivery will be done for you as successfully in any group for maybe one. Okay, you go to an expensive hospital, 200,000. But if you don't want to, 200,000, there's delivery of 15,000. Don't worry, your baby will be born. But let's even assume that you're a big man, you know. You want the obstetrician from the time your wife to feel the first pain. He's there. And the pediatrician is waiting to collect the baby. With all the gadgets to resuscitate if necessary. And the theater are waiting in case they change their mind. They want to go and do CS. Listen, in this end of today, if you bring 500k, I can recruit all those people for you. And I'll get my cut on top of this. Incident. Everything I've said now, I'll get cut. I know guys are a cause, oh boy. You won't make 150. One rich woman is in labor. Say, what do I need to do? Just bring your gadgets. Not just to catch picking. 150, yes. Ah. Hey. Hey. The guy go arrive with an ambulance. They sit down. <laughs> ah, this is not be Lagos. This is not Enugu. Now, Lagos would do Shagala. I say, I the day London. This is the day America. Enugu. Okay, that. I will even recruit an anesthetist. And your wife won't feel any pain. And 500 can have the talk. And don't forget my court day inside. Yet, you will find 5 million, 3 million to cross the sea. Why? You want to give your son a chance in life. Let me give you the word of God. Why are, you, why are they laughing? No, it's scripture now. I mean, me, what do you concern me? I just give you the word. Of. He said, they travel through the wilderness. All this and Egypt will give you nothing in return. That's the word I wanted to give you. If you're a Christian, listen, there are things unbelievers do. They, they will get away with it. You, believer, you will not. You will not. It is a sin. Listen to what I'm about to say. It is a sin. For you to prosper so much in a country like this, yet use your prosperity as a Christian. Please, if you are an unbeliever, you have not given your life to Christ, I am not talking to you. I'm talking to the people of God. It is a sin for you to take your wife, your children, keep them in another country. You are giving yourself to sexual temptations. 
Whether you do it or not, you have sinned. I'm not even talking about, uh, Pastor, I know myself, I control myself. Control is your, that's your problem. I'm telling you that for you to leave a child fatherless, I see them three times in a year, you are walking in sin. Oh, and you are earning the money from here. That's, that's the annoying part. Shows you are not poor. I'll t- t- look, they are true. Somebody has to say, well, all of us can just be nice, 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 nice. Reconcile with your wife. What is wrong with you? Say, so we didn't quarrel. You quarreled. Is it, is one of the reasons that the Bible gave us for men to marry is so that they will not burn? What are you telling me? One of our brothers said, what annoys him is that you see Christians copying unbelievers. You see your wife once in four months. And you're not, you're not even preaching the gospel. It's not as if like you're an apostle. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're a prophet somewhere. Is this, this now work you did do? It's normal trade. Normal business. For what? That's the point. For what? You wouldn't do this to preach the gospel. You wouldn't do this to advance anything. Because there is a lie that you bought. That is security for the future. I've been sent by God to give you a word of correction. Say you will get nothing for it. Nothing. Nothing. Zero. And God wants to bless his people. He teaches them what is right to do. That's what he said. He said, God will wait so that he might be gracious to you. He said, you know what he said? I like my New American standard there. He said, you said we're wrong. He said, therefore, those that pursue you will be swift. Look, no, he said, you said we're wrong. He said, therefore, you will run. I will give you cause to run. He said, we will say we will flee on horses. I have plenty of money. He said, therefore, I will increase your expenses. I don't know what I hear what I said. That's what God said. One of our brothers who tells me, he said, look, he said, may money not send us on an errand. May this blessing that God has given us, may it not turn to a curse. And he is saying it with seriousness. Why are you alive? Why are you not the one training your children, old man? You saw that thing I read earlier. And I say, good education. The education is good. What do you call good education? Nothing wrong with the expensive schools, though. Any good schools are not even costly. When I hear some schools I hear of in Lagos, now wow. Yet, even in Enugu, I said, I don't believe in paying a lot of money for school. You see where I'm going. I'm not saying, I'm not telling you not to do that. You can do that. But you see where I'm going to go. What's my reason? I said, I've observed it. That my wife does most of the work with the, with the auntie, one of the, my children's aunties that comes to give them home lessons. I said, I've noticed that most of the work is done by my wife and this woman. Me assisting once in a while. My wife will sit down from the time Akinulu was traced. I still remember tracing to write A. I remember it well. If you, I can, I have the picture here. I can show it to you. One day I sent it to him. He's a big boy in university. Now use as my deep. It's all his friends in school. Can see it. I have the picture right here on my phone. You see him struggling. It's A he wants to write. So the energy. He was a little boy. My wife was there watching. The time my wife finally left him alone was when he began to do DYDX. <laughs> and the woman talked to herself, say, I think, in the interest of peace. She did most of the work. I, I saw it happen. So I said that, no, if I have to pay anybody, I pay her, I pay Auntie Joma. No, I said, no. If I have a lot of money to pay, I say I give it to them. It's not fair. Can't give to because you painted your school. Shining is very, it's shining. No. I, no, I know who did the work. And listen, your parents, listen to me. No matter how much you are paying in school, please, train those kids is your job. Sit down there. Where's your homework? Ben Carson will say to you, he became what he became in life. Because his mother insisted here, is that they did not even know the woman could not read. The woman was saying, where's your homework? They didn't know that the woman could do, didn't know what was homework or home play. She did not know. The, he said, look, she's prayed. And God said she must, they must, he said God told them, he, her, that they must read two books every week. Any topic, she did not care. And they must give her a summary. Boys were giving summaries to an illiterate woman. They did not know. She just made sure that they did the work. And that thing turned his life around. 
The woman said, I don't care what you read, but you must read. I don't care what you read, but you must read. So again, when they said, but he found geology interesting. So he started reading geology. So he learned about rocks. Then one day in class, the teacher brought a piece of rock. Say, who knows about this? Because he never knew anything. He didn't, he just sat at the back. He didn't see anything. He didn't even really pay attention. Expected all the smart, smart boys in class to answer the question. But they could not. Ah. He said, that rock, obsidian or something. He said, I, I, I know it now. So he crept up his hand. And uh, the teacher was surprised. Okay, casting. So he got up and told the teacher about the rock. The teacher was like, wow, everybody. Ben, what happened? And then, you know, what do you want to do for him? That, so if I read, I can know. Oh, so he read, no. He said, eh, hey, this is the key to being a big boy in this class. No problem. He said, I go, that is, now it's not to obey mommy, now it's to be important in school. That's how God set him on the path of becoming the man that he became, that we are here in Nigeria talking about him long after he had retired as a neurosurgeon. It's your job to train your kids. You don't have to know the subject. Just stand there and say, where is the work? Let me see it. When he comes back from school, what did your teacher write on it? Then Cassie said that. He said that. How do, how do you get children to read? He said he doesn't understand that question. That didn't cross their mind to disobey their mother. <laughs> They're like, how do you get your children to read? You know, and how do you get them to stop watching TV? The only is that my mother just said, put off the TV. And the TV went off. There was no... Her mouth was a remote control. There was no... <laughs> he said, this generation, we have to discuss with you guys. The demand is confused. That, we have to discuss it. That in his days... Mommy said, no TV. That was it. Whether she's there or not, television won't come on. Her mouth shut the TV. She, she could kill and make her life. That is... <laughs> we have parents these days. They can't do that. You know what God said? If you want to make plans, make plan. check out the plans I have made. For time's sake, let me rush through some things. What is God's plan for the destiny of your children? It's not... This is a prophetic word. It's not their citizenship. When I say prophetic, I'm not telling you, thus says the Lord, in next week, uh, the moon shall set in, uh, in uh, Abia and rise. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm spiritually discerning, decoding, and interpreting the situations of people's lives right now. Removing the negative things in their minds. Listen to me. The destiny of your children is not determined by their citizenship. Don't waste your money. Don't waste your money. It's not determined by that. A number of things determine the destiny of your children. Number one, have you blessed them? Isaac said, I have sustained it with grain and with new wine. You need to lay hands on those children and pronounce a blessing upon them. Number two, he says, Sin, he said I have chosen him that he might teach his children and his household after him the way of the Lord in doing righteousness and justice. So that the Lord can bring to pass the promise he has made concerning him. Are you teaching them righteousness and justice? Or you think that somebody can stand in front of them and persuade them there is no God. And they have to be inclusive and recognize same-sex marriage. And understand that people can have any sexuality they want. So that in, in the U.S. now there are 50, I was told there are 53 genders. The one I read for you right now, those are genders. This one that they are doing inclusion training. Lesbian, gay, gender, queer, bisexual, demisexual, transgender, transsexual, two-spirit, intersex, queer, questioning, asexual, allies, pansexual, polyamorous. And the teacher has been trained to be inclusive. And you think that is good education. And you pay your money for that. I want to give you the word of God again. He said... Egypt will give you nothing for all this effort. Egypt will give you what? Nothing. Nothing. People don't learn. They don't learn. They don't learn. Just watching other people's life. Listen, I'm talking to Christians now. Let me just focus on believers. God said, if you want to make plans, it must be my plans. It's an instruction. You disobey it at your own peril. How do I plan for my children? He said, first of all, oh boy, oh girl, plan to ensure that they know the word of God. Make, that is your plan, is that these children must know the word of God. 
They must fear God. That should be the primary thing. You consider yourself a failure, except they, 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 they know the Lord. Except they fear him. Except they learn righteousness and justice. Do what you have to do to ensure they learn righteousness and justice. And that is how I plan for the destiny of your descendants. And lay a hand on them periodically. Teach them the word, then bless them. Say to them, the Lord will bless you. The Lord will keep you. The Lord will make you great in this life. Say you are the seed of the righteous. You will be mighty on this earth. You pray for them that their faith will not be secondhand. Yes, there's secondhand faith. I believe only because my father believes. I believe only because my mother is a believer. But there is personal faith. In which Jesus says, I've revealed myself to Abraham. Now I need to talk to Isaac. I hope you're getting my point. And he comes to Isaac and he teaches Isaac about the covenant. In which Jesus comes and says, I've talked to Isaac. But Jacob is not just going to quote Isaac or quote Abraham. I need to meet Jacob. So Jacob learned to offer his own sacrifices. Not because Isaac offered, but because he met the true God. He was in Bethel. So this is the house of God. He saw angels ascending and descending. He made his personal consecration to God. God met him and kept him in the house of Laban. When he returned, it was based on instruction. He was preserved by encounters with the Lord. So even though you hear the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, each person, the God of Jacob, each person met him individually. And that's why he was not called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That would have been third hand when he got to Jacob. The God of Abraham, Abraham met him. The God of Isaac, Isaac met him. And the God of Jacob, Jacob knew him personally. So you pray for the children and say, Lord, this faith must not be handed me down. It must, it must not be it was handed to me. It may have been in my grandmother Eunice, in my mother Lois, whose grandmother, whose mother, anyway, but you know what I'm going to say. But it must also be in me, Timothy. It becomes a prayer. That is what is important. Not asking God, give me Saul. Give me Saul. Give me a king. God said, you are rejecting me. Many people have rejected the God of destiny by the actions they are taking today. They have rejected the God of destiny. Because they think they can build their own destiny with their own hands. Listen, I'm not saying we'll not pass through difficult times. Yes, we will. That's why I told the stories last time. But you know, I look back now. How did God even help us some of those things? He just gave me a sense of destiny. That's all. Honestly. Just a sense of destiny. This destiny thing, we're not changing it. Anytime I teach about how to wait for God, I always explain to people there's a method for it. This faith that just says, ah, hey, just go, just declare abundance, it just come. You have to wait sometimes. And one of the ways you wait for the Lord is learn how to manage your life. There's a spiritual key to spending, making 1,000 and spread as if it's, it's 10,000. There's a spiritual principle which includes self-discipline. God can give you a, a kind of, a spirit of sleep. That anytime you hit the bed, you don't wake up till morning. He said, what has that got to do with what I'm talking about? I'll tell you what it has got to do with it. It means, that, it means anytime you go to sleep, that there's power or no power, you don't wake up. Some people are looking for money to buy generator and put AC and make sure it can run throughout the night. For you, you say, eh. When you enter your house, you carry your fan. You throw your fan two times, you've slept off. You wake up in the morning, the bed is soaked with sweat. You say, eh. You keep it out, it dries. You are refreshed like the man who slept inside AC. God has given you more money than many people have. You just don't realize it. The ability to sleep. You know, you know what the Bible says? When money increases, the number of people that spend it increases. We look at it like if I have more money, my cousins, my friends will spend. That is one. But the more money you have, the more BMW collects. The more EEDC collects. The more clothes collect. Do you know that? That's what God is saying. If I compare what I spent, you know, both directly and indirectly, wearing clothes now is very funny. It could have clothed me for like 50 years when I was young. I'm not kidding about it. I'm not kidding about it. Both what I have to pay and what is dashed to me, if you check the value, that will have bought me 
those kind of shirts I used to wear, like, like 50 of them at a go. Now it's in just one thing. It's the word of God. When money increases, you know, the other day I saw something, I couldn't believe it. You know, when you are browsing, you are looking for things. It was one of these news sites. I normally don't read entertainment news. It's not my business. But this one caught my eyes. You know why? They said, celebrities that repeat their clothes. Ah, I said, these people, wicked souls. That she wore this blouse on the 15th of September, 2018. And she was found repeating it in July, 2019. I said, yeah. <laughs> then you want to kill these people. It's in the Bible anyway. When money increases, the number of mouths that eat it increases. So celebrities can't wear cloth two times. Well, why should you wear two times? You are earning one million dollars <laughs> every month. So the person that doesn't have it, don't feel bad. You've been wearing your, the same shirt every other day for three weeks. No, we have not noticed. It's a blessing. Those days, what I did, I just made sure they were white. For you to know, even if you're a paparazzi photographer, the Holy Spirit needs to tell you which is which because all of them look the same. There are wisdoms that God gives you for the waiting period. If you're a minister and you must wear a suit, you just start a ministry, just buy one black or navy blue suit, one white shirt, and a lot of ties, or plain ties, are very cheap. Even if you're a paparazzi, nobody knows what you're wearing. What do you concern anybody? Don't envy the man who's changing his own every day. He's under pressure. Oh, you don't know? Can you see how God helps us? You'll be envying people who are under pressure. If I, if I like wear my clothes every other week, it wouldn't concern you. If I, well, if I vex, if I vex, if I feel like you are looking, if I suspect you are looking, I'm not warning you now. If I suspect you are looking, I will wear this same thing to Bible study like every day for like three months. Then you will get tired. Just, just try me. If you come and say, Pastor, you wore this in last week. I say, eh? I was wearing it every Saturday. By the third month, you will go and gather money and say, oh God, we are both <laughs> But I'm going to say, listen, there will be difficult times. I'm not saying there won't be difficult times. But there's grace to go through those difficult times. And it manifests in a lot of simple things. It manifests in a lot, a lot, a lot of simple things. You change the way, the kind of diet, I mean, the kind of food that interests you. Those days when I was in Lagos, I didn't used to eat apples. I didn't know why anybody ate apples. Now I can afford it too, but the, those days have not left my mind. So I'm still thinking, why are you just buying? It took me years to adapt to people buying apples. You think I'm joking? And I'm not lying. No. My own was so bad, I had a neighbor. If I enter her apartment, she's like, she, maybe she, she used to buy apple and enjoy it. Bank, do you want an apple? I said, no. Say, why not? I said, you are enjoying it. Please have fun. I said to me, it's the same taste as orange. Why should I waste your, or your resources? Do you know I refuse to eat it though? She, I said, no, I'm not eating. I was that disciplined. But now, I can eat apple for, <laughs> I can diet with apple. Even though my body will still be reacting anyway, because I've not gotten over it. 20 years later, I have not gotten It's my wife that brought all those funny, funny habits into my life. God just said, look, Banky will still be living like a poor man. Let me give him this girl that has eaten apple before. So, <laughs> the Lord is good. I said the Lord is good. Listen, let's stretch our hands into God's hands. Let him lead us somewhere great in life. Let's bow our heads to pray. Let's give him thanks again. Let's say, Lord, thank you for freedom.